Veterans in Transition is sponsored by HireVeteransFirst.com, Jelani Consulting, and Village Connector Community. Welcome to Veterans in Transition, where we promote the veteran community. Each week, we travel around the region highlighting veteran-related news issues and events. In this episode, we introduce you to a woman who refused chemotherapy and lives to empower others to a healthy lifestyle. In business, we'll share tips on becoming procurement ready. We highlight an organization headed by U.S. Naval Academy grads that prepares the next generation for college. We'll preview our upcoming Vietnam Veterans Special and this week's Vets Talk. She comes from a military family, an ovarian cancer survivor. She's a former U.S. Air Force Colonel who served as a physicist for over 26 years. During her time in the Air Force, she specialized in the area of electro-optics and laser. She's experienced with space launch, missile defense, biological defense, and NATO operations. Deanna's journey is inspiring and a true testament to her tenacity in seeking to heal in mind, body, and spirit. She has woven together her background in science along with her intuition and faith to persevere against all odds. Correspondent Michelle Irby has this story. So how did you make that transition from boots to heels or a transition from military to civilian life or entrepreneurship? Well, that's an interesting story because um, I almost did not live to see my retirement. Um, basically, when I was um, at my last assignment, uh, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I still, you know, just remember it very vividly in my mind. Um, you know, I, I made the decision to try to heal naturally and holistically because I realized that even on a morphine IV, it did nothing to reduce my pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, within three months of making that change uh, to my diet and nutrition, I noticed that my elevated tumor markers uh, came back to normal. And not only that, but the tumor, which was on my left ovary, actually began to shrink. Mm. And so I kept this up, and um, 10 months into this, I, um, you know, I, I get tested, and um, you know, find that the tumor is actually starting to die from the inside out. And so I naively assumed at that point that, oh, everything is under control. And I went back to working my 16 to 18 hour days in the military and went travel, you know, TDY, you know, on business overseas to Asia, to the Philippines and Korea, where I could not maintain that diet and regimen. And um, I can still remember the night that I landed back in Korea, back from Korea, um, I hemorrhaged. Um, and you know, I could see the, the bruising on my abdomen and I started to hemorrhage just right on a regular basis every two weeks. And it seemed as if I crossed a point of no return because then my tumor started to grow aggressively. My tumor markers that were normal just became extremely elevated. And um, within about six months after that, my lungs collapsed, filled with fluid, and my doctors lost hope for my survival at that point. And they placed me under hospice care on oxygen, and my oncologist gave me one to two months to live. And when I was in that state, you know, I, I started reflecting back on my time in the military. It was about 26 years. And I just thought, wow, you know, I gave the best part of my life to the Air Force um, and it was a pleasure to serve our country but then I felt like wow now I'm not even gonna be able to live to see my retirement but um, you know and so they were preparing me to die um, trying to give me morphine to control the pain uh, one day my um, blood pressure took a huge dip and all the muscles in my body began to contract and I felt like that was near the end of my life because I went for close to 40 days without being able to eat anything solid and even drinking fluids was extremely painful and now you know with my my breath 
challenge as it was. I just knew it was a matter of time. And so uh, when my blood pressure took a dip like that, I just wanted to see if there was just one last chance that the medical um, community could perhaps help me. So um, I you know, was taken by ambulance to a hospital and um, they, um, they drew a lot of fluid out of my abdomen and um, then they admitted me and my oncologist wanted me to start chemotherapy right away. Um, and he said he would give me two days to think about it. Um, well, during those two days, I, I prayed and I, I just said to God, you know, if you want me to do chemo, I will, but you know, you're gonna have to tell me directly because as a scientist, I know how detrimental chemo is on the immune system. And so what came back to me was, well, you know, they just took that fluid out of your abdomen. Why don't you ask for the cytology report? And so I did. The next day, I asked the doctor for it, and he refused. He said, you know, um, your condition is so poor. You've got one to two months left to live. If you don't do the chemo, I'm going to put you right back into hospice where you are most certainly going to die. And I, I pushed back, you know, because of what I had heard in my prayers. And um, finally, he agreed. And uh, he came back to me two days later and he said, you know, your intuition to wait for this report was a good one because it came back negative for cancer cells. That was a shock to all the doctors. It was certainly a surprise for me. And so he says, now this opens up the opportunity for you to have surgery. And so I agreed to that and had to get transferred to another hospital. Um, you know, it, it was just a, a very long process because my blood levels were low and they weren't sure I was even strong enough to undergo a major surgery. I had to go through five blood transfusions but I uh, came through that and went through three months of intensive rehabilitation. And that's what um, gave me the passion to actually start my business because I realized that there was a lot of research and a lot that I learned through uh, being confronted with my own mortality. And I started my business mainly to try to uh, give hope to people who are dealing with chronic health issues and to just educate people that there are um, alternative methods to healing, you know, in conjunction with conventional medical treatment. So I won't ask you what makes it unique because your testimony in and of itself makes it unique and you are um, a walking billboard for answered prayer. And um, so the keys to your success, how would you say that um, your, your journey has made you successful. What do you offer as keys to success for your business? I would say just having um, a desire to learn, you know, a desire to seek the truth in, in all things uh, because, um, you know, sometimes we may get used to certain systems and ways of doing things. And I think we need to learn, you know, that there might be other ways of doing things. That was certainly my own journey. I, you know, I, there were many things I learned. I, I actually had to learn how to let go, you know, and uh, the first let go that I had to learn was to let go of my career. You know, it, that's what actually, you know, just my desire to serve and, you know, the duty that they instill in us as military officers and, you know, we're, we're always just pushing for the mission to try to take care of the people. And um, I did not take care of myself in the process. And so I had to learn to let go, you know, and to realize that my identity was not wrapped around my career, that there was much more to life and my purpose here, you know, in this life. And um, I also had to learn how to let go of my way of thinking because, you know, as a scientist, it's very easy for me to, to just get very analytical about things. But I, you know, at a certain point, I had to realize that, you know, I, I, you know, something had to be done or I would not be here on this earth much longer, you know, um, just realizing that I did everything I knew how to do and I would have to, you know, just yield myself to, you know, what was God's will in all of this. Um, and the final let go that I learned was 
to let go of life itself uh, because I needed to have that peace in order to go into the surgery because, you know, we have fear that just creates just, you know, stress and all these biochemical changes in the body which uh, really don't help our immune system. And so, ironically, I just had to learn how to let go of life and just trust that God had my life in His hands and that even if my physical body, you know, um, were no longer here, um, I, I believe my spirit would continue to live. Leadership Links. The founding members are all graduates from the U.S. Naval Academy. Their purpose? To develop servant leaders who are committed to leaving a legacy of global impact. Recently, they held a Links Forum for Youth at the University of Maryland College Park, providing leadership, education, and college preparation for students and parents. What I want to talk to you about today is positive peer pressure. When I was running track and leading the student body, the people that were doing those things were not the people that were getting in trouble. Because there was a level of accountability. There was a level of positive peer pressure among their friends. Leadership Links was a vision that I had on my heart, really just to connect with other like-minded leaders. And so we are people of, of faith. We're people that um, believe to whom much is given, much is required. And so we're really community focused and service oriented people. Um, all of us have served in the United States Navy or the United States Marine Corps. And so it's really important for us to raise up the next generation of leaders. For the 3.4, the 3.2 and the 3.3, welcome to Leadership Links. My presentation today was primarily about getting people prepared for the admissions process altogether. You know, a lot of people know that they have to apply to college, but they're not exactly sure to whom they're applying and who's going to make the decision as to whether or not they get into a school or not. And we basically just want to give people a good sense of, of who it is that they're applying to once their application uh, gets submitted and also what the process is in terms of selection. We start early. We start in kindergarten and we have a beautiful group of young ladies here who have linked up with Leadership Links and plan to continue that partnership to see them through college and graduate school. Our students linked up with Leadership Links this past summer and since that link up we have noticed that our students are more attentive, we've noticed that they're more confident, we've noticed that their, their public speaking skills have improved, we've noticed that they've taken ownership of their purpose and, and really are developing a sisterhood around success. So we are um, elated about what Leadership Links is bringing to our school. Are you looking to do business with prime contractors or the federal government? Do you understand the federal environment? Diane Dempsey with BAE Systems sat down with veteran correspondent Catherine Roberts to discuss how to be procurement ready. Tell us a little bit about the SBA Mentor Protege program that you guys have and in particular how it affects veterans. The SBA Mentor Protege program was recently launched in an effort to allow all small businesses, including veteran owned small businesses, to engage in a Mentor Protege program. The program is particularly of interest to veteran-owned small businesses as in many cases they're venturing out and they need to grow and develop their companies. It does require a certain maturation model to be effective, meaning they have to have the staff and capability to allow someone to participate in the training. But more importantly, it should be part of any veteran or small business growth strategy moving forward as they develop and sustain their business. That's wonderful. Now tell us a little bit about the cybersecurity and financial readiness for veterans. Well, I always talk about being procurement ready because if you have the opportunity to support a prime contractor or the government, you need to be procurement ready and that means you need to understand the environment in which we contract so they know how to submit a proposal they need to understand cost elements that make them competitive. They also need to understand the financial health of their company is very important. We need to know that when we contract with a company, they'll be able to complete the tasking. And that tasking could be as long as five years. Uh, we also look at cybersecurity initiatives to make sure that as part of our supply chain, they have certain elements in place that will guard our data and their data
from cyber attacks. So that's a very important initiative. Now, obviously you enjoy working with veterans. You have a statement that you're known for. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I always tell small businesses and veteran businesses to make sure that they follow up. And we always refer to it as uh, the FU initiative because we need to make sure that people understand the critical part of following up. When you meet me as a veteran-owned small business, woman-owned small business, at an event like this, and I ask you to send your capability information to me, you must do that in order to allow me to send it to our acquisition teams. Unless you follow up in the appropriate manner, you're never going to get any business with any prime contractors or with the government. So efficient and effective follow-up, providing the information and data that's needed to review the company and vet it properly is critical to your success. So tell us, what is your favorite part about working with women veterans? Seeing the growth and development in business in general is exciting. Uh, working with women-owned veterans that have already contributed um, an enormous amount of their time and energy in defending our country and supporting us uh, is also part of the initiative in terms of allowing them to continue their success. They are already successful when they leave the military because they've achieved their goals in that respect, but it's more important for them to be able to achieve those business and personal goals as they develop their companies, grow, and hopefully employ other veterans and other women. So please share with our viewers what your bit of advice would be if you're, as a woman and as a veteran. Well, always be ready to respond effectively and efficiently. I think that follow-up is critical. I call it flawless performance. You want to be able to execute at the highest level. You never want your customer to have to come to you with a complaint. You want to understand the environment, you want to know that your performance is critical to the mission, whatever the mission is, and you want them to feel that you are a trusted partner at all times. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your wisdom and your time. My pleasure. In this week's Vets Talk, Navy veteran Tim Pelton shares with us his life lesson of working the system. Good evening, everyone. It's, it's really an, an honor and privilege to be here. And I want to take a few moments and share with you a life lesson that I learned very early in my Navy career. Now, there's some people in this room that can remember back to 1971. That was a long time ago. I was in boot camp, boot camp at Great Lakes up in Illinois, and I swear it was the coldest winter in the 20th century. But the Navy, being the Navy that I uh, learned to, to grow in love, detailed me to San Diego after Great Lakes to thaw out. And before the term was even created, I was a computer geek. And if you think back to 1971, there was more power in my iPhone today than there was in a 50,000 square foot computer room in the service 40 something years ago. And here is the life lesson. Every organization, every business has a system. And either you work the system or the system works you. And let me share that with an example. I'm in computer school and I, I had, had graduated from college so I had some computer experience. And so I am hanging out with the instructors and perhaps visiting a couple of bars in the San Diego area, whereas some of the other students that were 18, 19, et cetera, didn't do that. We're halfway through school, and one of my shipmates comes in and looks at me and goes, Tim, it's not good. What? what? What's not good? Well, one of his shipmates was a uh, detailer, the person that assigns duty stations after your A school and the Bureau of Personnel here in DC. I said, I, I just spoke to my buddy, and you're going to ADAC. Rodney, what, what kind of ship, what's the ADAC? It, it's not a ship. It's the last island in the Aleutian chain off Alaska, 100 miles from Alaska, monitoring the Soviet Union for missile attacks. 
you're right. This, 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 this is not good. How do we fix it? Well, let's start with 50 bucks and a case of Johnny Walker. <laughs> so there's really only one more question. Johnny Walker red, Johnny Walker black. So, and on an E3's pay grade, that was a fair chunk of change all those many years ago. So every couple of weeks I'd say, Rodney, how, how's it going? Uh, I don't know if I tell you, I gotta kill you. I just, you know, I, I just don't know, I just don't know. So we get to graduation. Senior Master Chief has all our orders under his arm. And he gets to me and he says, Pelton, where'd you wanna go? Boston Navy Yard, senior. No, no, no. Brooklyn, 0 for 2. Norfolk, I'm working my way down the East Coast because I had hopes that I might be able to marry that beautiful woman over there in the corner. <laughs> and so he says, nope, you're going to Nav Cossack. Excuse me, senior, what the hell is a Nav Cossack? Naval Command, System Support Activity, Building 196, Washington Navy Yard. And I looked over at my friend, and today we high five and we, we, we butt slap and do all kinds. It was just a little, and it's all it took. And so that was the life lesson that I learned that there's a system and you need to work the system. And in the rest of my Navy career, fire service career, entrepreneurial career, I help people work the system. It's that simple. I pay it forward every day from an experience that came to me a long, long time ago. And the takeaway for tonight is integrity is simply doing the right thing even if no one is looking. Thank you. As a commemorative partner with the Vietnam War commemoration, Veterans in Transition assembled five Vietnam veterans to share their story of service, sacrifice, lessons learned, and giving back to the community. Here's a sample of what's to come in our upcoming Veterans in Transition Vietnam special. 2007 Congress begins to understand that it did not properly, the country did not properly thank the veterans. 2008, President Bush signs a proclamation which starts the process. We began in 2012 with the actual commemoration. Today begins the 50th commemoration of our war in Vietnam. It's another opportunity to say to our Vietnam veterans what we should have been saying from the beginning. Welcome home. Thank you. I joined the Marine Corps at age 17 and I graduated from high school in 1966, in uh, June of 1966, and in July of 1966, I was in an exotic island called Paris Island, South Carolina. And one of the advantages that I think I had was that I stayed, you know, I was a regular officer, so I was still on active duty, but I was serving with many of the same people I'd served with in Vietnam. And we told those stories over and over again <clears throat> and I think that was the thing that helped us come back to earth. I heard great stories so the only place that I felt that I should go was the Navy. At the age of 16 I asked my mom to allow me to join the Navy Reserve. Uh, the Port of Palm Beach was just a few blocks away basically and I wanted to be able to start my career early because I knew exactly what I wanted to do in my life. I'm uh, making my way through and I'm in that last 45 days or so where you start to get really, really cautious and really concerned. And, uh, man. And the strangest thing is you get to a phase where you're not even sure you want to go home. And I want to tell you, Vietnam was what inspired me to do more, to be more, and to become the person I became today.
That's all for this edition of Veterans in Transition. We ask that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you have a story, reach out to us at vetsintransition.com. And remember, we all have a story to tell. Until next time. before 9 a.m. than most people do all day. I said, well, I don't wake up to seven and be finished by nine, sign me up. And I went in the army. I got the basic training. They woke us up four o'clock in the morning. You should be finished by nine if somebody wake you up four o'clock in the morning. They got us up there running. We are running and marching everywhere. Every time I turn around, there are vehicles on the road too. Why can't we get in the vehicle? Then I go to Iraq. Lord have mercy.